Since the dawn of time, North America and South America drifted independent of each other. Between four and five million years ago, the slow but inexorable movement of the tectonic plates caused upheavals. Volcanoes and mountains thrust upwards, resulting in a veritable geological and biological bridge between the two Americas. The plant and wildlife of the two continents mixed and flourished. Later, the human populations that emigrated from Asia would use also this natural corridor. Some would settle here, others continued their slow migration towards the south and would eventually populate the entire continent of South America all the way down to the Tierra del Fuego. From the conquistadors and for Christopher Columbus, who explored the shores of this isthmus on his fourth and final voyage in 1502, this new world was just an impassable obstacle on the route to India, which was everyone's goal at the time. Núñez de Balboa, an adventurer, had heard from the Indians about a mysterious stretch of water that lay beyond the mountains. He managed to make his way across the isthmus and on the 25th of September, 1513, discovered the shores of the Pacific Ocean. And from that day until the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914, men have been crossing from north to south and from east to west this fragile ribbon of land the crossroad of the Americas. Five centuries have gone by since the arrival of the Spanish. Disease, slavery, genocide, like everywhere else in Latin America, colonization has exacted a heavy toll from the Amerindians. And in Costa Rica, they have almost completely disappeared. On the other hand, what does take us back to the pre-Columbian period is the primeval forest. On board the Yorktown Clipper, a small coastal cruiser in the company of naturalist guides, we'll be discovering some of the most beautiful natural parks on the Pacific side of Panama and Costa Rica. This region has now become one of the world's favorite destinations for ecotourism. In 1970, the Costa Rican government, spurred as much by economic considerations as by ecological awareness, decided to reverse the trend of massive deforestation resulting from the intensification of farming and cattle raising and undertook a vast environmental protection program. Now, close to 30 national reserves and parks cover 25% of the country's surface, a world record and the enormous crocodiles of the Rio Tacoles have thrived under this protection. They say that there are more than 200 per kilometer on this stretch of river that cuts through the Caracas Reserve. Dennis is Costa Rican. He is the Yorktown Clippers onboard naturalist. Today he's taking a small group of nature lovers to visit the Kuru Wildlife Refuge.
Due to the geological formation of Costa Rica and Panama, they are the youngest part of the continent. For a long time, a sea channel separated North and South America until the intense volcanic and tectonic activity thrust up a biological corridor from out of the ocean. By linking the north and south, this corridor allowed the natural species of the two subcontinents to migrate and cross over. For example, we can find species of monkeys native to South America here, like the capuchins, and we have other animals like the raccoon that come from North America. Due to the climatic and topographic conditions, there is a vast biodiversity here. We count 850 species of birds, 220 mammals, 9,000 plant species. They figure there are 13,000, but only 9,000 have been catalogued. There's rain all year round in Costa Rica especially in the parts covered by the tropical forest, which generate their own precipitation. In spite of the raindrops that weigh down their fragile wings, this couple of butterflies persist in their graceful mating dance. The rain is coming down even harder, but it doesn't seem to bother this sloth as he leisurely makes his way from branch to branch. The sloth has a very special relationship with the algae that develops in its fur. This algae uses the fur as a habitat where it can grow, but at the same time it provides the animal with camouflage and that's his main protection against predators. It's a very slow-moving species, so as he can't flee from his predators, this is a way for him to hide more efficiently in the treetops. Ecotourism is vital for our country for two reasons. First, it's very important because it is one of our country's main sources of income. Secondly, which for me is even more important, is to make people aware of the importance of the tropical forest, but also its fragility. So it's important to protect it, and not only for the tourists visiting our country, but also for Costa Rica's future generations. Since the dawn of time, migrating birds have used the natural route of Costa Rica, this biological corridor, on their way north and south. Today, the flat asphalt ribbon of the Pan American Highway offers a sharp contrast to the rugged landscape. Fleets of trucks rumble up and down this road, which stretches thousands of kilometers across Central America. The Pan American Highway, which cuts through the country from north to south, along the Cordillera leads to San Jose, the capital of Costa Rica. San Jose doesn't have the prestige and elegance of the major colonial capitals like Santo Domingo, Mexico City and Havana. Its atmosphere is closer to that of old Europe than one of the turbulent Latin American cities. Maybe that's why Costa Rica is known as the Switzerland of Central America. Or it could be on account of the political stability and the relatively strong economy, which attracts many Nicaraguans looking for work.
there's nothing like a trip to the market to get a real sample of the colors and aromas of Central America. Guatemala, Panama and Colombia still have relatively large proportions of Amerindians, but in Costa Rica they make up no more than 1% of the population. Who were the Amerindians that inhabited Costa Rica before the Spanish conquest? The answer is to be found in the National Museum of San Jose. The first groups began to arrive around 12,000 years ago. They settled here and they lived in harmony with nature, with their whole environment and they began to develop their own cultures, a civilization very different from that of the Mayas or the Incas. These people had begun to develop their own worldview. In the south, they've discovered thousands of perfectly shaped spheres of all sizes made by the Indians. Was this an astrological calendar, a means of communication? Even today, we still don't know their true significance. It's important to understand that these groups living here weren't isolated. They communicated and traded with other groups of different cultures living on the continent. They probably learned how to make pottery from groups living in the south and how to work with polychromatic pottery and jade from populations living in the north, in Mesoamerica. And it's important to note that they not only assimilated these techniques, they also expressed their own worldview through them and developed an original culture founded on very characteristic features specific to them and found nowhere else. As we continue our journey along the Pacific coast, we come into view of the Marenko Biological Reserve. Until the railroad was built in the middle of the 19th century, it was very difficult to cross the isthmus from north to south or from east to west. The high mountains, the jungle and the heavy rains made every trip a dangerous adventure. This was the world of the Indians. Only they knew how to travel. The Indians knew how to make canoes, they had communications. The problem was that almost all the Indians on the coast were forced by the Spanish to carry out other types of work. On the island over there, they found large stone spheres. We think that they formed a sort of information center for the people traveling up and down the coast. And maybe they didn't stop very often in Costa Rica, maybe one or two stops before continuing on their way, but there was coastal traffic, and they found proof of that. Once again, the rain is drumming down on the selva. 
As we follow our young guide, Gustavo, who works year-round in the reserve, we try to understand just how the Indians organize their life in the middle of such a seemingly hostile environment. This forest has been inhabited for a long time, long before the Spanish arrived. The Indians had to put up with all the climactic conditions, the rain in particular. They built dwellings especially adapted to this type of region. They used palm fronds, like the ones we see here, the suita, to roof the houses. The suita palm is a completely waterproof plant, so the people could keep dry. Whenever someone got sick, they would find all the medications in the forest. Almost every plant they found had a specific use. They would also extract the fiber, to make clothes, hammocks, for everything, absolutely everything. You could find everything here. And even today you can find some people in this part of Costa Rica who still live just like the Indians used to live. We call this plant the monkey's ladder. This plant is typical of the primeval forest. What it does is it climbs upward to get the light. The Indians would use it. They would take a bit of the bark from the monkey's ladder, boil it, and use it as a painkiller. It's kind of like nature's aspirin. The Indians lived in perfect symbiosis with their environment, the humid tropical forest. They knew the hidden power of many plants. How many did they have in their pharmacopoeia? A few dozen, a few hundred? In any case, very few compared to the 13,000 species that biologists have catalogued. The Costa Rican scientists, who are now working to isolate new substances for pharmaceutical uses, are exploring a second way, after ecotourism, of capitalizing on their country's surprising biodiversity. In this 18th century painting, Christopher Columbus, master of the new world, seems to be gauging the width of the narrow isthmus of Panama. And yet at his death in 1506, he was unaware that the famous western route to India, which he spent his life searching for, lay less than 80 kilometers from this coast that he had discovered on his fourth and final voyage. A few years later, Núñez de Balboa made his way across the thick jungle covering the Isthmus of Panama and discovered the shores of the Pacific, which at the time he called the Great South Sea. The Spanish immediately realized that this would be an extremely valuable asset for them. The treasures amassed during the conquests of Colombia, Peru and Ecuador could henceforth be transported from the Pacific side of Panama to the Atlantic side where they would be shipped off to Spain. So they set about constructing ports, erecting fortifications and blazing trails for the mule trains that would cross the country. The first trail, El Camino Real, went from Porto Bello and Nombre de Dios to the old city of Panama, 
Another struck out from San Lorenzo when new stretches of the Rio Chagres. Ramiro lives in Portobello. He's an amateur historian, fascinated by Panama's colonial history. I've always said that Portobello's main asset was its bay. According to the Spanish, it could harbor around a thousand gallons and a hundred smaller ships. They had to fortify the bay because this was a port of transit for the huge quantities of gold, silver and precious stones from the Inca Empire, which stretched from Bolivia to Ecuador and made up the great southern empire. Control of the isthmus gave the Spanish a clear strategic advantage with respect to the other colonial powers. For more than two centuries, goods coming not only from the Pacific coast of America, but also from Asia, were transported through Panama on their way to Europe. But from the beginning of the 18th century on, there was a marked increase in piracy. The Spanish could no longer protect their convoys. So in 1746, they decided to stop transporting merchandise by the Camino Real. From then on, the merchant ships would take the Cape Horn route, which was longer, but less risky. Deserted by the commercial sailing ships, the old ports were abandoned, one by one. Now, Portobello is just a quiet town, basking in the memories of its glorious past. For a long time, Costa Rica, in the heart of Central America, was a land with difficult access, with no more than a few rocky mule trails crossing it. In the middle of the 19th century, the California Gold Rush brought about 2,000 adventurers a month from the cities on the east coast of the United States. They would cross Costa Rica by cart to get to the Pacific coast, where they would embark on another ship headed for the El Dorado of California. The 19th century was also the golden age of coffee, bananas, and the railroad. Abandoned at the end of the 1980s for the highways, the railroad lines that can still be glimpsed here and there in the landscape are all that remains of an incredible adventure. In 1880, the wealthy coffee producers, backed by powerful American banana companies, put pressure on the Costa Rican government to undertake the construction of a railroad system. They wanted a rapid way of getting their bananas to the ports where they could be shipped to Europe and the United States. A 
And so two lines were constructed from San Jose, to Punta Arenas on the Pacific coast and to Puerto Limon on the Atlantic. On the 7th of February, 1880, the first clusters of bananas were loaded at Puerto Limon and shipped to New York. Banana shipping is still the main activity of Puerto Limon, but when the ultra-modern banana terminal was inaugurated a few years ago, the town lost a bit of its soul, the price paid to progress. Many Jamaicans were brought to Costa Rica at the end of the 19th century to work on the railroad. Their descendants settled in Puerto Limon and make it a real Caribbean city. Francisco, a former docker, savors the memories of Puerto Limon's atmosphere in its glory days. I'm from Santo Domingo de Heredia. I came here in 1948. I started working on the docks of Puerto Limón in 1952. Back then, we'd load the bananas in clusters. There weren't any crates or containers. We'd load them onto launches. Loading them for the first time, it all went fine. We passed the clusters in a chain from the dock to the boat. But it was a very big launch. And down in the hold, they'd take the clusters and stack them. But sometimes you had these really big clusters that would break and fall on their heads. So some would end up a bit uh, punch drunk. I remember the trains. They came from the Standard. That was back at the time of the Standard Fruit Company. That train was beautiful. The locomotive was all black, and that sound. Ah, uh, Limon without the banana town is a lost port. There'd be nothing to do here, a ghost town. The Yorktown Clipper continues on its way. We leave Costa Rica and head south for Panama. Even though we're quite close to the Panama Canal, we don't sight any cargo ships. Yeah, a few Just a few dolphins who seem to be having fun racing with our boat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We do have some dolphin off the bow and off our port side at this time. For those of you that might be interested, some dolphin are in the area. The program for the rest of the day on board is lectures and leisure. Two billion dollar enterprise business, especially for Ecuador exporting. Okay. But the handmade car makes are not. The next morning, the Yorktown Clipper is anchored off the Isthmus of Darien, 
now called the Isthmus of Panama. This region, one of the most remote of Panama, is very close to Colombia. The passengers board long pirogues. They belong to the natives of a community of Choco Indians. Their village, La Chunga, is a few dozen kilometers inland. We leave the sea behind and head inland. The Indian village is upstream on the banks of the river Rio Sambu. The channel of the river gets more and more narrow. We're entering a mangrove swamp. From the exposed roots of the mangrove trees, we can estimate the tide levels at this point in the river. We're greeted by Ricardo, who's the chief of this village of Choco Indians. There are about 400 inhabitants living here in the community of La Chunga, including children and adults. We've been living here for four generations, always in the same place. We haven't budged. We come from the province of Choco. That's where our name Choco comes from. We have our own language. There are five distinct tribes living in Panama. In the north, for example, you have the Novi Bugli and the Kunas. They speak different languages. They dress and think differently. We live in the middle of the jungle, but today, even here, we can feel how the world is changing. Education has arrived in our village. So I think that when Europeans and Americans come here, we should learn from them in the same way they should learn from us. A good part of our income comes, as you can see, from the sale of our handicrafts. Education has helped us a lot. It lets us support our families better. I don't think that we've changed, but we've strengthened the ties with our culture. That way we can remember who we are and live our native culture anew. Uno lo usamos para 
We use tattoos, men as well as women, when we're out in the sun. It's a sort of lotion that protects our skin. We use it for festivals and religious celebrations as well. People here talk a lot about sorcery, for example. The spirit says that we have to make specific designs to cure a sick person. That's why we do tattoos. The next morning, we're anchored at Panama. Through the mist, we can make out the shape of the Bridge of the Americas, which marks the entrance to the canal. A little further offshore, dozens of freighters are waiting for clearance to proceed into the first lock. With its skyline of skyscrapers, Panama City stakes its claim as a modern metropolis. The old city, where the Camino Real, coming from the Atlantic, ended, is gone. It was destroyed in 1671, when it was raided by the pirate Henry Morgan. A new city was in fact founded a few kilometers from the site of the old one, but several fires in the 18th century laid waste to a good part of it. And so this town on the shores of the Pacific would slumber through the 19th century under the construction of the canal, which was to make it one of the most far-famed spots on the planet. Since the time of Emperor Charles V, men have dreamed of a waterway to cross the isthmus. The Frenchman, Ferdinand de Lesseps, obtained a concession from the Colombian government, founded the Compagnie Universelle, and embarked on the adventure in 1880. At the time, 
Ferdinand de Lesseps was at the height of his prestige. He had a widespread reputation as the man who built the Suez Canal just a few years before. But very quickly, the difficulties began to crop up. De Lesseps, following his experience, thought he could use the same equipment in Panama that he'd previously used to dig the Suez Canal, because he thought it was like Suez here, with sand. But when he arrived in Panama, he realized he'd be dealing with a mountainous region, with lots of vegetation, swarms of mosquitoes, a lot of water, a long rainy season. It was so different, it changed his project. The machines he brought were too heavy and unsuited for the terrain. That was one of the main difficulties he encountered here in Panama. The project quickly takes a disastrous turn due to the inappropriate technical means, but also on account of the ravages caused by malaria. At the time, they didn't know that it was transmitted by the bite of a certain mosquito. The toll in human lives is tragic, 20,000 dead, many Europeans, but Africans and West Indians as well. There's the figure of 5,000 malaria victims just for the city of Cologne. De Lesseps can't meet the expenses. The Compagnie Universelle goes bankrupt. The French interlude closes on a tragedy. The Americans, with the impetus of President Theodore Roosevelt, step in. Theodore Roosevelt realized that he needed a place that would ensure the protection of his country in time of war. He was a visionary in this matter, so he really backed the canal. Throughout the period of negotiations, the United States government was extremely eager to have the canal, and the president was behind the project. They bought out the bankrupt French company. They got it for a good price along with all the equipment. And they managed to set up the project. The work resumed in 1904. The Americans saw that technically, one of the main problems was evacuating the huge quantities of stone ripped out of the mountain. So the first thing they did was to construct railroad lines where they could run huge wagons. In the course of the work, 259 million cubic meters were excavated. But the improved techniques were not the whole answer. A Cuban, Dr. Finley, discovered how yellow fever is transmitted. So huge quantities of insecticide were sprayed over the region to protect the 25,000 people working on the site. In 1914, ten years after work had begun a second time, the first ships sailed into the canal. The next morning we leave the Yorktown Clipper, which heads back to Costa Rica and board a little boat used only to go through the canal. Slowly we approach the first lock, Miraflores. The canal is basically a water bridge. The locks are there to overcome the mountain, because thanks to them, the boats are lifted up to the level of Lake Gatun. 26 meters above sea level. It's an artificial lake, and its islands are the peaks of submerged mountains. At the far end of the lake, the boats are lowered down to sea level. So the boats are lifted up, they sail across, and then are lowered down. The gigantic gates that close the locks are the very same ones that were installed at the beginning of the 20th century. 
The reason for such longevity is that the locks are filled with fresh water, not salt water, which would have quickly corroded the gates. 13,000 ships pass through the canal every year. These vessels are classified Panamax, which means they have the dimensions required to pass through the locks. But certain container ships and oil tankers are so large, they have only a few centimeters leeway on either side of the hull. In order to be able to take the canal, ships can be no more than 292 meters long and 32.2 meters wide. Another condition is that one of the canal pilots take command to guide the ship. He doesn't take the helm. He gives his instructions to the captain, who has to carry them out to the letter. The towing locomotives are nicknamed the lock mules, and the drivers also get their instructions directly from the canal pilot. And another basic condition to cross the canal is the toll. It's pay as you go for everyone, no credit. The average price for a freighter is $64,000. This particular ship paid $125,000. If so many ships use the Panama Canal in spite of the extremely high toll fee, it's because they can save thousands of kilometers on the sea route. taken our turn going through the Miraflores, then the Pedro Miguel locks, and we're approaching one of the most spectacular spots of the whole canal, Corte Culebra. Looking down from the surrounding heights, it really looks like the ships are sailing into a sort of gigantic trench dug right into the heart of the mountains and vegetation. The Culebra cut was really the major challenge because there was a lot of erosion. At the same time, it was very mountainous, with a geological formation that was volcanic. So there were spots where they had to blast the rock. They had to cut through a veritable mountain. They had to go through several different layers of terrain. There were even spots where hills had to be completely leveled. It was very difficult, and it cost a good number of lives.
Gatun Lake is one of the world's largest artificial lakes. It's fed continually by rivers that converge from all over the country into an enormous reservoir. And so we can see just how much rain is the true wealth of Panama, for without it, there would be no canal. Once we've crossed the lake, we near the three Gatun locks. After our 80-kilometer crossing, we arrive at the end of our voyage in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean.